Well, welcome and good afternoon to the CHC podcast seminar series with CI Solutions. My name is Chase Marable, one of the co-hosts of the Community Health Center podcast with Dawson Nimmo, as well managing director with Higginbotham Insurance to welcome you to today's podcast. Uh, before we get started, just a few notes. We will have time for questions and discussion during the podcast today. Um, at that time, you have a option on your screen that says raise hand. Uh, if you would like to participate in that discussion or have a question for our speaker, please hit that raise hand. We will go ahead and allow you to talk and then you can join in on that discussion uh, or, or have your questions uh, be presented to Chad. The uh, seminar today will be recorded and for viewing uh, after today's session, we will send that out in a follow-up email. And then thank you to Higginbotham for being our presenting sponsor of today's seminar. Higginbotham is the largest community health center insurance broker in the country, providing options for medical insurance, FTCA gap, property, liability, workers' compensation, and human resources solutions. Uh, thank you to Higginbotham for sponsoring today's event. Uh, first, I would like to welcome Justin Plutino. Justin Plutino is a servant leader who thrives on continuous improvement. He has a deep-seated passion for problem solving and a lifelong commitment to learning. His mission is to empower businesses to take ownership and accountability of their processes, fostering an environment of growth and success. Justin is committed to helping others achieve their goals and welcomes the chance to connect with professionals who share this vision. He invites you to embark on this journey of continuous improvement together. Uh, please help me welcome Director of Business Development with CI Solutions, Justin Plutino. Thank you, Chase, for that great introduction. Folks, it's our absolute pleasure to be here and to be able to present to you um, on this topic of change leadership. As uh, Chase had said, I'm the Director of Business Development for CI Solutions, so I'll make it pretty brief on the introduction here. Um, you'll probably hear from me for outreach, and if there's any ways that um, I can help you uh, meet your unmet needs for continuous improvement, I'd be happy to have that conversation with you. Um, as Chad's getting the, the prep of the slides together, um, it's my privilege and honor to uh, introduce Chad Smith talking to you about change leadership. Justin, I'm grateful for you. Uh, Chase, thank you so much for uh, hosting us today. I'm excited. Uh, I'm excited to share some doses of hope. And that's one of the things that was so apparent in Justin's, uh, uh, in Justin's bio, just kind of his background. Like that's that's why we do what we do. Um, so today we are going to talk about mastering the tools of change for lasting improvement. We're going to dive into some topics. Listen, as much as I appreciate the fact that we're online together, I wish we could be face to face, but we're going to try our best to overcome that today by making this interactive. So please, um, as we get to discussion topics that kind of pique your interest, you're like, oh, that's interesting. Please be bold and be the one to raise your hand. Um, others around the uh, others around the the uh, the session today, they're going to get so much out of your courage to say, "Hey, I want to be part of this conversation." Let's talk a little bit about why CI Solutions exist. Exists. Um, we see people that are awesome people, great people every day. Um, and I've been doing this since 2005, right? CI Solutions, me and another fellow, founded it in 2005. We've we've been doing continuous improvement for a long time. In fact, I've worked uh, in this business for myself since 2007. We now are a, a team of 12 serving all across the country and, and all around the world, really helping helping people um, do great work. Our why is pretty simple. People in business and, and organizations that oftentimes is untapped because we don't have very good processes and strategy in place to draw out their ideas for improvement. And people walk home, they carry the process frustration home with them into their home life and in through their weekend and they dread coming back on a Monday. Our job is simple. Every day we wake up, our, our job is to go out and deliver doses of hope to people stuck in bad process. And so really it is. It's process focused for CI Solutions. We focus in on the process of strategy for senior leadership teams. We focus in on the process of understanding value streams and constraints and products and service flow and information flow as well. And teaching leaders how to go do that for themselves so they can map their current state and go to the future state. We teach people all up and down the chain of an organization to learn how to let continuous improvement principles to make their daily situations better. And boy, I tell you what, this is an exciting time for us to practice that. And one of the things why we like doing these sorts of webinars and 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 things like today, um, our principle of GI squared, 
it probably better written. I'm a mechanical engineer by training, um, you know, and unfortunately I had to suffer through a lot of math. Probably I should have put um, brackets around the GI portion so it's all squared. But GI squared for us means give it and you'll get it. Um, we're happy to give it out. In fact, I've sent to uh, Chase, uh, man, Chase, thank you so much for the opportunity to serve today. I've sent to Chase a, a PDF of this presentation that you're gonna you're gonna receive after after the uh, presentation is over today. And we want you to have this information so you can go back and and uh, work in your health centers right now um, to have dialogue and to have good conversation about how to be better. Um, that's what we that's what we desire. We know give it out and uh, give it out freely that it's going to come back to fold and we're just grateful to be here to be able to do this work um, with you today a little bit about us right we serve lots of different organizations we've got quite a lot of work in healthcare and healthcare centers as well which are unique um, in that you guys are out here doing things uh, kind of closing gaps that, that exist in the existing healthcare system um, as you can see we serve some pretty large uh, healthcare institutions uh, um, and uh, that sort of thing but we have served lots of different companies and uh, Really, our claim to fame is that we understand continuous improvement really well. Uh, we understand how to uh, bring teams together and how, how to help teams learn how to work together to solve problems systematically. And uh, that's our area of expertise. So that means all business, uh, all business that exists out in the world really are good candidates for process improvement. We love getting to do what we do. And uh, anyway, super fun times. Um, I do want to mention it one more time that that custom solutions are really what we're all about. So if you're having trouble with a process, you can't seem to get a process figured out, or it's not clear as to where you're heading five years down the road, and you really don't have a, a, a plan for deployment and a follow-up and follow-through process that, that, that helps you go there, helps you get to that five-year vision, right? If you don't understand how your value streams operate and where your current constraints are, or if you see frustration with your people, where they're just kind of like having to do workarounds in their process and the processes don't run really well. Maybe your customers, uh, those, those folks that come into the health centers, they're not well satisfied with your service. Maybe you're trying to meet metrics and uh, make sure that you're driving improvement. Reach out to us. Uh, we work with custom, custom problems all day long. That's where we excel. And when we get together with organizations and kind of sift down through those, we can oftentimes help find those sweet spots that really continuous improvement can help. And we'll also tell you if, if that continuous improvement is not a good fit. So, but please reach out to us. Justin is, is ready and waiting and we'd love to hear from you. Just to get to know me a little bit more, I'm a pilot, an aviation nut. My dad and I went to Footville, Ohio on a Friday and we drove back all the way to Missouri um, with what you see in the upper right on the trailer. And it, it does fly now. So that's the, that's the bottom, that's the bottom result of all of our hard work. But uh, the, the airplane that, that I run around in the, the best technology 1976 had to offer. That's a 1976 Grumman Tiger down there in the bottom, love to fly. If you're a fellow pilot, man, raise your hand, send a message, uh, let us know, uh, we can do some hangar flying. I also like to play music, I'm a saxophone player. I've played in a cover band uh, here locally in the, in Northwest Arkansas, a couple cover bands over the years and, and really enjoy that the cover band thing is always fun. You just never know what you're gonna play. Um, but this is really the reason I get up and do my thing. Uh, my wife is over here on the left. Uh, we're rolling up on 30 years in May. So we're, we're well in our 29th year of being married. Uh, my daughter there in the middle, she's 19, year, 19 years old. Yes, she does play the saxophone. Um, she's a sophomore in college currently, um, getting after some environmental science. And then over on the far right-hand side is my son. He is adopted, as you can probably tell. Um, he's our touch of the South Pacific in our family. Um, he's got Marsh Lee's heritage. But he's also got a basketball streak, and this kid is getting after it with basketball. Um, so he is really enjoying that. So we're having a good time here in Northwest Arkansas. By the way, that is where I live, about 10 minutes north of Bentonville, Arkansas. So, you know, it's a beautiful area. If you like to mountain bike, come down and hang out. It's amazing. Let's get into it. We're going to talk about change leadership, and in this in this particular module, um, hopefully, we revolutionize your leadership style. Um, hopefully we give you new perspectives or maybe we refresh some old perspectives that have kind of grown a little old and musty. Um, you know, our ultimate goal in all this discussion today is to help you guys make change stick. If when we get to the end of this presentation, there's going to be a slide that says improvement equals change. Now, kind of getting started though, change does not always equal improvement. And so one of the things that we teach in continuous improvement when we're teaching skills in and around a around this we've done a lot of a lot of this work in healthcare situations 
is testing the idea that when we do improvements, it's an experiment. And the experiment is an opportunity for us to learn. And so, so as we go through this presentation, I hope that you learn more about your own leadership style. I hope that you learn about your ability to be a better leader and to drive change in a better way. And so that's exactly what our agenda is going to be today. Um, so without any further ado, here are the seven topics we're going to cover. Uh, by the way, the seventh topic, we're going to come back in February. We're going to unpa unpack the seventh topic even more um, and expand it uh, a little bit more on the process, the individual, uh, some of the tips and tricks and tools and so on. But uh, yeah, we're going to cover all these elements here, um, one through seven today as we get started. Check this out. Overall leader, right? You've got to be a good leader if you want to lead change. And you may have heard the maximum, great leaders are born, not made. But President Kennedy, one of his phrases was learning and leadership are indispensable. And so this is oftentimes a place where we react to that. And uh, today, with just the complexities of raising hands and so on, I want to make sure we get through the topics. But, but let, me let me explore some concepts with you here. You know, leadership, as we go through, like you've, you've worked for people that are natural born leaders. I mean, you, 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 you're around people that are like that. You're like, my gosh, they just are really, really good leaders. But here's the thing about the rest of us. <laughs> the rest of us can work to make ourselves a better leader. And that's, that's the challenge that's before us. And really, that is the challenge of the presentation. What we're setting up here is this first, this first intro slide is this idea that you got to lean into it. You got to lean into it to become that better leader in order to position change um, in front of people in a way that people will accept it and will appreciate it and will own it and will move it forward and get a priority, not try to undermine it or not try to just sit on the side. Right? The idea that we can learn as individuals to develop effective leadership skills, that we can continue to refine that throughout our careers. That is super important, and that's one of the first things each one of us has to recognize. If we're unable to recognize it, it means we're stagnant. I'll tell you a little story. I went to a, uh, an emotional intelligence class years ago when I became a, a quality manager for a, uh, a production plant, and <laughs> I sat next to this woman from the forestry service. And it's a class on developing emotional intelligence, like so you can improve your EQ, your emotional quotient, right? So you can improve that. And you can have good dialogue with people that work on your team and successful and all that sort of stuff. I said, hey, I said, wow, man, I'm excited to be here, excited to learn some tips and tricks on how I can really engage my people better and that sort of thing. I said, why are you here? She said, I'm here because my boss told me to come here. I don't even understand. It doesn't make any sense to me. And I think the whole question that I asked her was answered in that one moment. So at the very least, I hope that you're open-minded. I hope this slide allows you to see through this presentation and say, yeah, I'm going to sit here and I'm going to, I'm going to work now on me. I'm going to be accepting of the idea that I can gather some ideas today that allow me um, to, um, to be a better leader. And in fact, what we're going to do is we're going to start off with one of my favorite leadership tools of all time. This is called the theory of situational leadership. And it was originally developed by Ken Blanchard. Um, and there was a, a second author in the first version of it, but then Ken Blanchard refined it in the in the theory of situational leadership too. Give him tons of credit for recognizing this. And what we're going to see, this diagram is important. What we're going to see is we're going to see the pairing up of development levels of the individuals. Those are recognized or represented here by the Ds. So D1, D2, D3, D4. They're shown as that chevron shape because they move from one to the next to the next to the next. There's not a way I can bypass it and go from a one to a D3, for instance, right? Then below that, the diagram that we've got below that for the S's, those are leadership style matches. And so it's drawn as a quadrant, basically these four quadrants, and you may have seen it before, S1, S2, S3, and S4 leadership styles. And those arrows are on that line that looks kind of like a histogram. That's called a railroad track. And again, as leaders, as we adjust our leadership styles to match the development levels of the individuals we're serving, it also says that we can't jump from S1 to S3. We've got to follow the tracks. Or we can't go from S3 to S1 or S4 to S1. We've got to follow the tracks. This is going to be important as we unpack 
the details about each one of these categories or criteria. So, so let's go learn, right? We've seen the diagram now. We know intuitively it looks like S1's matched with D1, S2's matched with D1. What does this mean, though? Let's explore it a little further, and I'll explain it a little bit more. And here in just a few slides, we're going to actually have a chance to raise our hands. And we're going to ask, actually ask for a few, a couple scenarios of some mismatches that have occurred. So if you're kind of already tracking to this, you're like, hmm, maybe I've been in bad leadership situations before. You don't have to incriminate and give names, that sort of thing. But maybe you can share with us some of the, some of the elements that happened. Let's talk about the summary of what situational leadership is all about. It's based on the principle there's no best leadership style. In fact, it tells us that if we're going to lead change well, right, effective leadership occurs when the appropriate leadership style is matched with an individual's development, development level. And the thing I want to really key in on here, this is super important for this podcast today. Development levels are task specific. So imagine you've got a specialist that's coming to your clinic, right? They've hired into your clinic. Maybe they're an x-ray tech. I don't know. Maybe they're, they're doing some sort of that sort of business. They know their x-ray processes really, really well. But they may not understand where the bathrooms are. They may not know how the coffee gets made or where the coffee is stored. Tell me about how to operate the coffee pot. So even though you've got somebody coming into your clinic that is an expert in an area, as a leader, in order to, to, to set them up for the best performance, you've got to know the development level of their given task. That's a challenge, right? That's the challenge. In fact, this whole thing was underpinned, again, by another conference I went to. I actually learned this at another, another training session that I went to years ago. It was a real, a real inflection point in my career where I recognized that I had a usual behavior, a usual style, a usual leadership style, and didn't really deviate from that much. And so it was fine if the people were at that level, but when they weren't, there was a mismatch and we had a lack of productivity. So if you think about leading change, right, what does that mean? Well, you've got to match your leadership style with the development level. And let's talk about the match. Let's talk about the match. If I've got an S1 directing leadership style, I should be using that with somebody at a D1 which is basically low competence, high commitment development level. And this is specific for a task. So a new hire coming in, I ought to be very directive and tell them things about where to go find data and who owns this process and how do they get their badge or who do they go talk to to reset their password on their brand new computer, right? I'm going to have to think about these things and I'm going to have to be very specific and very directive. Now, for those of us that are leaders that are fast paced and we've got a lot of stuff going on, this is hard sometimes because oftentimes we run around, we just don't have the time to dedicate to really walk alongside those, those folks that are new to a given task. It can also be an internal promotion. So I've, I've shown pretty good, pretty, good, um, um, uh, pretty good work as a phlebotomist. Maybe I've been doing that sort of, sort of work. And I'm going to move into the admin side. Well, I'm really unfamiliar with the admin side. I've got a lot of good leadership characteristics, but I'm new to the task. You got to bring me in and pull me in and, and really walk me through this at a very systematic way. The next level, ironically enough, this is where my usual level was at the time. I'll tell a little story about that in a minute. S2 coaching leadership style. This is a coaching leadership style that should be used with a D2, a low to some competence, low commitment development level individual. Now, remember, D1 precedes a D2, and this is actually kind of bad. Look at the different levels of commitment between a D1 and a D2 leader, right? A D1 leader, high commitment. D2 leader, low commitment. Here's what people go through. When they get on board and they, they get in, into doing their work and they're excited about the tasks that they're given, there is a time and place when people reach this point where they realize what they don't know and it becomes overwhelming. And that's actually a big problem. So we've got these people that we're leading out here that are kind of getting discouraged. Right, they've got some competence, but they're not fully competent on the task. And man, they're just like, they're kind of beat down. And so our job as leaders is we've got to elevate them and pull them back up again and kind of coach them through the situation. We're probably going to have to make the decisions. That's an important thing to know. When you've got D2 folks, oh my gosh, D2 folks are risky, right? Because they're likely, got, they've likely got one foot out the door. And in today's labor environment, although it is correcting some, it's really important to work with people 
that are D2s to help them get out of this and to move on to a D3. And let's take a look then. Let's say you've been successful moving them over to a D3 level. So look at the mat. An S3 supportive leadership style, very different than coaching now. It's now supportive. Should be used with a D3 high competence and variable commitment level. In other words, they've got the competence, but they don't believe in themselves. See that variable commitment? They're like, oh, I'm not so sure. And you're like, no, I'm sure. You got this. Like, you can do this. Like, that's awesome. Last but not least, this is oftentimes the area where, number one, we really don't need to spend a whole lot of time as leaders um, with the D4s, but we also run a risk of burning out D4s. Let's talk about it. S4 is a delegating leadership style. I'm going to help a D4 see kind of the bigger picture, the strategic direction of the organization, the vision for the future, what what success looks like and in, in, in whatever we're working on. Man, and then all of a sudden, now the D4, high commitment, high competence, they're rocking. But you know what? They can also get dumped on because they're the ones that get it done. And so they're oftentimes your overworked people. The people that have been there 10, 15 years, you've got a nurse that does everything. They know everything. They're the go-to person for everything. You've got to protect these people because you know what? They could suffer from, suffer from burnout for sure. So now we're going to dig into some of the details behind the scenes. We've talked about this kind of as a high-level summary. We've talked about the matches between S1, D1, S2, D2, S3, D3, S4, D4. Now we're going to dive into some of the details. And here's how I would characterize each one of these leadership styles. S1, and it acknowledges enthusiasm while teaching and showing how. I'm going to walk with you and teach you and show you how. One of the CI techniques that we use, in fact, I was just teaching a batch of black belts last week, and we were referring back to some of the work done way back in World War II on developing workforce. Um, it's called training within industry, and it's it, the, the routine is really good, and I'll share it here because I think it's applicable at, a, at an S1 level. Um, if I'm going to teach somebody how to do something, I'm going to sit down, and I'm going to show them. So say I'm analyzing a report or pulling in some data or whatever. Um, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to show them what I'm doing and I'm going to tell them what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. Then the next round, they're going to be watching. I'm going to do it and I'm going to have, have them tell me what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. The next time after that, they're going to sit down and they're going to do it and I'm going to be over here telling them why and what they're doing. And the final time when it's them on their own, I'm going to let them sit here. I'm going to be standing next to them. I'm going to let them do it. Um, let them tell me why and what while they're doing it. So that's a great kind of routine. Anyways, these that's a, that's a thing that we teach organizations as well as kind of that routine of of how do you how do you engage people in new processes? Think about change, right? We're thinking about change. You're leading change. If you're helping people see it, if you're helping people see a new way of doing things, this is where you start. As I mentioned before, S two, uh, this is the difficult part right here. Encourages individuals through frequent feedback and praise to build confidence listens to individuals' concerns and ideas, but listen to this. An S2 leader ultimately makes the final decision. So they're, remember, they're not fully competent yet. So you can't throw an, a D2 level individual into making all the decisions. That's going to be a disaster for them, for their confidence, because they're probably going to make a mistake. So protect them. You make the decision. But you don't want them to stay there because they're probably frustrated in that role. You want to grow them into being fully competent, but maybe not confident yet. So put them in an S3. Now you've got a D3 individual. You're going to adjust your leadership style to match, and you're going to encourage the individual to take the lead in goal setting, right, for themselves, action planning, the problem solving that they've got. You're going to provide support, reassurance, and encouragement. You're going to praise them throughout the whole situation. They acknowledge the competence, right, so it's not hollow praise. It's actually got some substance to it, like you actually identify some things that they're doing well and highlight it. So they, they, they then have something to play back in their own narrative. And through that, then you build commitment. By the way, in S3 leaders, the leader's not making the decision anymore. You're walking alongside somebody and encourage that, encouraging that D3 to make the decision. And then S4, I mean, if you've got an S4 leadership style, what are you doing? You're going to expect the individual to take charge and keep others informed. In other words, like, hey, here's our strategy. Here's what we're doing. You good? You good? Okay, great. And we, we march on. Trust the individual's judgment. The last slide about this, and remember, we're going to come to some mismatches here in just a second. So there's two two folks. We're going to be looking for two volunteers in just a second. If you're getting kind of passionate about this, man, hold on to that passion 
be ready to raise your hand here in just a second. First of all, an enthusiastic beginner is a D1. This is someone that's coming to your organization we've already talked about. They're new to the task or goal. They're inexperienced. They're eager to learn, willing to take direction. You can think of these folks as the, the little fireballs that come in. They're like new, and they're like new around here, like seeing everything the first time. They're super excited, but they don't know what they don't know, and they may do the wrong thing. Right, what they've done in another clinic or another healthcare setting or another admin setting, what they've done there, that may not translate exactly to how we do things around here. So you got to be careful about those, uh, like how you bring those people in. The disillusioned learner is the most discouraged person out there. Oh my gosh, look at this description. Has some knowledge and skills, not because this is my heart goes out to these people, right? It's not competent yet. They're discouraged, overwhelmed, confused, frustrated. They may be ready to quit. Developing and learning, they need reassurance that mistakes are part of the learning process. Man, those are the people you've got to grab a hold of before they walk out the door because they're they're probably pretty close to saying peace out on this because they're just not feeling like they got it. Hopefully. Your organization, you as a leader, can rally around them during change as change is going on, and you can help them see the new beginning and help them gain the confidence and the competence, and you can move them into a D3 level. They might be kicking and screaming, but you can move them into a capable but cautious performer where they're sometimes hesitant because they're not sure of themselves, right? They're unsure. They're tentative. Certainly not always confident. They're probably self-critical, maybe self-deprecating. And so if you hear those terms, right, if you're listening well, you might hear that, may need help at looking at skills objectively and makes productive contributions. And then last but not least, a D4, which is a self-reliant achiever and recognized by others as an expert, inspired, inspires others, proactive, maybe asked to do too much. And as, you, as we've talked about, they're consistently and justifiably confident. They can also be overworked. Watch out. My story. And then we're going to get your stories. I went to this executive leadership class, took a usual style survey for the situational leadership, thought I was an S2. Guess what? You might remember S2s. Who makes all the decisions in an S2 relationship? Oh, that's right, the leader. So as a quality manager of five really competent quality engineers, by the way, among a group of 12 individuals that worked at this team, as quality manager, guess what? I was making all the decisions. And it hit me like a ton of bricks in the session. When I came back and realized my usual, my usual belief was that I was going to be the S2 leader, that I was going to make all the decisions. Oh, when I found that out, it broke my heart because I recognized in the moment that my people weren't able to live up to what their value, worth, and purpose was. I was holding them back. In fact, I went back and had a conversation with each one of them and said, hey, here's what I think. You bring me ideas that, are, that you present for tentative feedback. And you wait on me to decide, is, how's that? And they're like, yeah, that's about right. I was like, oh, man, this is crappy. I was like, do you want it to change? They're like, yeah. I said, do you want me to just change it right now? They're like, yeah. I'm like, okay, it's done. And so from that point forward, that was an inflection point in my career where things became very much try to understand the development level of the individual, try to react and adjust my leadership style in order to best meet their needs. Here's where we need the two hands to go up. We've got the first one. We'd love to talk love to talk about this. Who can describe a time when you as an individual were micromanaged? And so Chase, I know you're watching for the hands to go up. We just would take one volunteer to describe that time. Love for you to come off mute. We'd love for you to hear love love to hear your story. We need one volunteer who can describe a time when you were micromanaged. Just one. Or at least one. By the way, this is the interactive portion of the session for those of you playing along at home. I'm pretty good with the silence. At least one person who could describe a time when they were micromanaged. Yeah, jump in there. Deb Farmer. Hi. Yeah, hi. Good morning, everyone. Um, hey, Deb. It was when I first became a CEO 
at my very first board meeting and I sat there for two hours listening to everyone tell me what I had to do, what my steps were supposed to be. And and they hired me because I'm known to be a change um, manager and turn organizations around. And yet they literally told me step by step of who I had to call, what I had to do, and everything else. And I finally stood up and just said, you know what? You hired me to do a job. Let me do my job. Because, exactly. So, Deb, yeah, let's let's explore that a little bit. So, in that moment, like, I mean, they hired you to do a job. That's what you were coming in to do. You're perfectly competent. Thankfully, you had the courage to step up. But what was it like making you feel in regards to innovation when they were like telling you what to do? Like, you've got all these great ideas floating around. You're getting ready to start getting after it. What did that do for those good ideas? Well, kind of for me, it kind of makes me a little bit more ferocious than, than normal. Um, but I my thought it, process it. was, you know, this agency was on the verge of shutting down. This 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 health yeah. center was on the verge of shutting down. They were so poorly managed. Why would you put forth the same ideas that you've been putting forth for 20 years and not listen to Amen. new ideas? So. Amen. Well, I really appreciate coming off mute, Deb. Thank you for getting us started today. And that's one of the things that you ended with there. And it's it's something that will will hold on to for a moment. Um, when people are told, it stifles creativity and innovation. And it's exactly the, 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 and I don't know your situation specifically, but I can imagine it's exactly what that organization needed is a little innovation and creativity to try to get out of the doldrums and good night. We definitely don't want to keep doing what we've always done because I'm pretty sure we know what that result's going to be. So can uh, I just say rate, there were really consequences to that? Um, 90% yeah, of my, 90% sure. of my board quit at the next meeting. <laughs> wow. So, that's okay. so let's talk about, it that's okay. is okay. Let's talk about, let's talk about the mismatch here, right? Those board leaders recognized maybe that they were unable to adjust their leadership style to match the development level of the individual. They had to go They're like, I can't do this. Like, I don't know how to adjust. And maybe they felt like I did originally where they had to make all the decisions in order to be a leader, which is actually mm -hmm. a misnomer. That's not the right, that's not the right thing. So golly, Deb, anything else you'd like to add before we, uh, before we uh, let you off the hook? Really appreciate your contribution today. Yeah. Thank you for letting me share. Thank you. You got it, Deb. Thanks so much. Uh, we'd love to take another one. Gosh, Deb's a hard act to follow for sure. Uh, who can describe a time when they felt like they were thrown to the wolves? Just raise your hand if you wouldn't mind. We do this, by the way, because like you'll get tired of hearing my voice. There are great stories and great examples that exist on these sorts of situations. There's a lot of virtual training, a lot of virtual facilitation. I, I don't need to be talking all the time. Somebody else step up because we can learn through your story and through your experience. Who can describe a time when they felt like they were thrown to the wolves? Be courageous here. And Vegas rules do apply. Well, I mean, it's being recorded, but you know, whatever. I know you guys are trying to eat your lunch. You're trying to like multitask. You got a million things on the afternoon schedule. You're like, look, let's get to it. Just like one little story here, one little example. I'd love to bring those stories out. I got an example. It might be early on in your career. I mean, you guys are all successful professionals I'm out here getting after it, leading organizations, leading departments, and so on. Um, but it probably was earlier in your career where you were just kind of like, Kind of that sink or swim moment. Anybody ever felt like that? Well, with respect to time, I will I will respectfully move on and not drag this out, although under normal circumstances I would let the silence just sit here for a while. But let's talk about the the fact that Oftentimes, and, and listen, we <laughs> we as leaders, and me, I'm going to put myself in this bucket. We as leaders, 
sometimes do this without even we create a situation like this where, without even really realizing it people come into our organization we're like hey there's the work this is an individual you can go talk to to get some more things going i've got 35 meetings i got to get to good luck and i i honestly sink or swim them and i don't even mean to i genuinely want to help them but i just don't have the time and so in this moment, it is critically important if you want to keep those people that are really excited and you want to limit their depth that they fall to in D2, as leaders, we've got to spend time with them. and We've got to go help them be set up for success. Maybe it's that you leverage resources internal to your organization to develop good developmental processes to intake people into new roles and to help them find their footing. I'm not sure, but I will tell you that a lot of us Type A personalities, me included, we're going to let people run, like we're going to put them in and like good luck. And that may not be the most fair thing for them. Um, we need to really support them through those early times when they get into that. So think about change, right? Anytime change happens, that's exactly it. One of the things that you might be faced with um, regarding change leadership is kind of this extension of what we learned with the leadership styles. Um, it may be associated with how you actually take change and execute it into your business. Now, remember, all that stuff we just covered is still in frame. Sometimes when we're making change, we simply have to tell it, right? You make the decision and tell people that need to know. And frankly, there are those kind of buck stops here, regulation changes. There's a new requirement to save Medicare, Medicaid. You just have to tell it like it is, and it just is, and it maybe even it kind of stinks. And those those sorts of changes are just not up for discussion. It's just not possible. But one of the things you can do is you can make sure you're highlighting that to your people and say, look, this is out of my hands. We got to go. Selling. You make the decision, then sell people on your idea. So that's the next kind of level of this where you're still making the decision, but you go out and promote it. Consulting, that's where you presented a tentative idea for feedback, and this is really the sweet spot for continuous improvement. And then consulting, that's, I'm sorry, then joining, that's when you present it out there with a set of criteria and the group reaches a consensus. That last one takes the longest. And uh, typically it's done only in continuous improvement settings when you have a facilitator that's not knowledgeable of the process at hand. So it would be different than a leader leading change, it would be more of a facilitator leading change in that case. I mean, these are things, again, kind of in this leadership vein, we're, we're kind of sticking in that first point. We're kind of going to go quick, quickly through this. These are what followers want from leaders. So again, we're getting some of those musty and some of those old things that we know about. We're bringing them back to the forefront. If you're going to lead change well, first things first, be honest about it. Show that there's competence in the organization, the ability to to get it done, a sense of direction, like where, how does this fit in our vision or inspiration? How does this inspire me or, or bring it to something that's credible, right? Really show me the, that you are a leader that I can get behind. And uh, if you're gonna lead change, you want people to basically be willing to walk through the hot coals to make it happen. And specifically, these are the areas typically that change is driven toward addressing, right? our particular service delivery. So how well are we meeting customers' expectations in terms of wait times? And uh, like how, man, how long out do they do they have to wait before they can actually um, uh, schedule an appointment, right? So, yeah. and then when we have them, like how are we doing inside that appointment? Are they always, uh, when they show up at the clinic, are they always late? Quality, what sort of care are we delivering, right? What are our metrics telling us? What sort of defects do we have? How are we focused on improvement? Profits, right? So what's our profits doing? I mean, I know we're all 501c3s, right? These are, you know, the way our organizations are structured. But frankly, the more money we bring in, the more we can serve. And uh, so, yeah, your, your leadership is key to success. And so really that kind of gets us going with this first overall leader section, right? If you're gonna do change well, the next thing you need to do is you need to plan the change and you need to plan that well with your team. Think about things like how do we manage our time? How do we not let the day-to-day -day fires and the day-to-day -day excitement get in the way of our good strategic progress toward getting this change implemented? And what are the sources of risk that exist out there? So doing a risk assessment is really important when you're thinking about leading change proactively assess those things that will be headwinds and things that will hold you back from getting the change implemented. 
build a plan. I mean, let's follow a plan. And so there's this old discussion now. I mean, you you may have heard like the difference between waterfall project planning and agile, right? Mostly that's associated with software development and uh, and the like. So still, the idea of building a project plan is not a bad idea. Um, Agile certainly helps when we're doing iterative software development, but sometimes it may not be a great fit for really thinking about things like critical path methodology and and the precedence and trying to figure out the length of time that it's going to take to, say, implement a new system. Um, Say it's from Epic or Cerner or from any, any sort of database that you may have. Building a project plan is really important, but doing it with your team. We have a saying here, by the way, that um, we want to make sure that whenever we lead change, that we avoid doing change unto others, rather we do change with others. Okay, and that's a very important statement right there to hold on to. If you were to write something down, that's an important thing to have and hold. Avoid doing change unto others, do change with others. Stephen Covey talked about this. We're talking about prioritization. Let's refer to some good stuff. There are four quadrants and you need to categorize your work or help your teams that are leading change to categorize their work, right? These things like separating out the things that are like in quadrant four, time wasters, busy work, procrastination activities, aimless internet browsing, I mean, good grief, and trying our best to move things toward, um, say, quadrants one, two, and three, quadrant run, things due today or tomorrow, dealing with emergencies or crises. Those are the things that are like that firefighting. But equally important, by the way, are quadrant two, long-term projects, planning ahead, studying in advance, getting started early. Quadrants one and two compete with each other for sure. I mean, quadrant three does as well, right? Fun events and social invitations, whatever, interruptions, distractions. Man, let's, let's try our best to help our people that are leading change focus in the front in those top categories. And you guys as leaders need to protect strategic time. So you need to encourage people to get out of quadrant run so they can make time for quadrant two work. It's really important to think about that. So as we're leading change in our organization, help people remember to go have that strategic time. Another one, this is Alan Lakin's idea, the the setting priorities ABC level. Um, We can categorize work items into these ABC categories, high priority, very important, medium priority, quite, quite important, but still important to do. Um, and the C status low priority at this time, um, low consequences if left undone. So again, these two these two are just examples of of priority models for sure. Uh, but again, something we can we can leverage or teach our people or remind our people about when we're going through change in the organization. Oh my goodness, why things don't get done? Why things don't get done? This is a very important element here. People don't. <laughs> People don't have a clear idea. The task is overwhelming. If we think about our work of change, fear of end result or failure, indecision or procrastination, you can see these. Again, this slide deck is coming out to you. I'd highly recommend that you have some dialogue. If you find delays in change, right? So you've built a plan and you're measuring against that plan and you're seeing that things are slipping, go out with this frame in front of you. Maybe talk to people and try to figure out what the root cause is for why we're slipping on our tasks or on our project timeline or on our change timeline and really go forward with that. So this is a great a great idea here. The next one is to coordinate the activities of team kind of moving on. This is a, a quick little quick little presentation. There are a series of things that we need to do as leaders when we're leading change. You can see here, one of the biggest ones down at the bottom is assigning tasks. If we walk out of a meeting and there's not a clear list of things that we need to go do, and when we're going to follow up and follow through on that, we've missed a huge opportunity. And so there's a ton of things to think about when we plan a team meeting. What's the purpose? Whose attendance is important to get things done? If we're thinking about change, whose attendance is important to drive support? What will the role be in the meeting and defining accomplishments and making assignments? You guys are all senior leaders, but maybe you're people that are one level or two levels below you. Maybe they don't know these things. Maybe you can use this information to go back and have good dialogue with them about how they can plan team uh, team meetings better and get more out of the out of the session. For instance, like 
logistical nightmares. I mean, let's not schedule things like right after lunch or after hours. Uh, consider the cost of a meeting. There are so many meetings in the world, and I think we ought to right-size our meetings, frankly. Uh, look at this bottom right-hand session over here. For instance, if an hourly wage for an individual is $35 an hour, a two-hour meeting for five people will cost $350. Bucks. Will something worth $350 bucks be, be accomplished? And so in a healthcare center, you guys are like trying to squeeze every dollar. Let's limit the amount of meetings. Let's make them super productive when we do it. But when we want to create change, one of the things we might want to do is encourage diverse points of view. And, and we, we recognize that in continuous improvement, brainstorming is probably the best tool that we've got um, to really begin to understand um, what the, the common themes are. We can use affinity diagramming, for instance, um, to help us find those common themes to really get the voice of the room, the voice of those process owners. Um, asking open-ended questions is really important. Today, I feel like my hands are tied because I want to have some dialogue with you guys, and we've only got the ability to raise hands, and I know we've got a limited amount of time together, so, uh, you know, we kind of keep moving, but I really think that's important. Um, if we think of continuing this, keep the group focused and moving, keep the group aware of where they are in the process, periodically summarize and ask for agreement, be decisive. Um, I think you guys would agree with that, but again, some of these things are really good reminders about things maybe we've practiced well in the past, but they deserve a bit of a dusting off for a bit of refreshing, a bit of a shining up in order for us to do it. I mean, things like assigning items throughout the meeting, you're like, well, duh, Chad. Yeah, but well, duh, there's a lot of meetings that I ask about um, people I facilitate. I'm like, hey, how many meetings have you been to this week? Um, ha has anybody been to a meeting this week with an agenda, right? There's a lot of a lot of participants that raise their hand and say, no, there were no agendas in any of the meetings that were sent out, meeting planners sent out. I'm like, good grief. How can we even consider that there's going to be actions assigned and follow-ups that are taken after that meeting? So make sure that these things are really important. In fact, if you want to write something down, one of the things that I teach people um, in regards to meeting planners, and they don't need to follow all these in terms of bullet points, but these are elements that should be good in, be good um, agenda starters for a meeting. Let me explain what grouper means. Goals, it's the first thing you write down. Roles, one of the roles, who's the timekeeper, who's the leader. Overview, how does this fit in our broader situation? The procedures, right? So how are we going to make decisions? When will we take breaks and, and, and lunch? expectations like this is the expectations of our of our of our group i'm sorry i left out the you you view you view what's in it for me right the you view the procedures right the procedures that's the next one that's what are all the procedures the expectations of the meeting right what are the expectations we expect to get out of this and what are our resources needed do we need a projector do we need a zoom set up right how are we going to going to link in everybody right so goals, roles, overview, you view, which is the WIFM, what's in it for me, teach that or tell that to people, the procedures, the expectations, and the resources. So yeah, this, and these are all these are all critical points of meeting. Encourage diverse points of view, no judgment, keep the group focused and moving, a time check, make sure that action items are planned, the action. Super important. And then there's all kinds of project meeting pitfalls. Um, I'm sure you can read through this list and find the one that really would speak to you. That's normally how I do this. But again, with respect to time, we're going to keep on trucking today. Um, avoid these if you can, please. Communicate. The next part is step four, communicate. When we communicate, we need to make sure the people we're communicating are the right people. We teach how to we teach people how to develop good communication plans. It's not only the what are we going to communicate. But it's the who we're going to communicate to, by what means, and at what frequency. And by the way, copying people on email is not effective communication, right? Having that rug you can rip out from underneath somebody, so, well, I copied you on the email in August, that's probably not effective communication. Communication is this thing of sending some information and verifying that, in fact, that individual received that information. But when we communicate, we need to avoid surprising our board. We need to avoid defensive behavior, right? So, so man, avoid like kind of like getting wound up and 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 bowing up against something. If somebody's got good feedback, meaningful feedback, 
Deb, kind of going back to your situation earlier, I don't think that was meaningful feedback. I think that was a misdirected and misguided set of leaders. They didn't know how to adjust their leadership style. That's different. But avoid defensive behavior when people have good feedback. I think that's important, especially I would say avoid defensive behavior when people within your organization, right, maybe even below your levels or at your peer level, when they've got good feedback, avoid defensive behavior when they when they have it. Um, super important. There are four ideas for ground rules for communication, but I will tell you that one in the upper right is the most important one of all four of these. When you have somebody that sends you an email, we've all had this happen, and it gets you completely wound up, and you start typing it back. Hopefully, you've put in the send to area, you've put your spouse or significant other or really good friend that you're going to send it to as your sounding board, and you fire off this email and send it, right? Here's what happens when that when – that, there's a physiological effect in our bodies. If we go back to cavemen days, there's two things we do when we're faced with a threat. We're going to either clock it, right? Or we're going to, it's the fight or flight, right? Fight. I'm going to clock it or I'm going to run away. And so my body automatically takes my blood out of here and moves it down to here. And so guess where my blood isn't? It isn't in my brain. And so I learned this technique years ago, and I'm sharing it with others. I love, I love for, for people to remember this. That idea about counting to 10 actually works, but it's even bigger than that. Look at what this statement says. Let others' ideas enter your head and sit side by side with your own idea. A good listener makes a decision with the most data. That's critically important. If you can let others' ideas sit side by side, completely competing ideas, ideas that might wreck your current, like your current vision, like they're just going to rock and roll it. If you can let it sit side by side, maybe you send them an email that says, hey, I just got your email. I'm going to go grab some lunch. Would you be available after lunch to maybe talk about this face to face? So you can go away, letting that idea sit. And then come back together with that individual that has that competing idea, and you can really begin to learn what they're trying to say and make a good decision. There are some really good recommendations here about improving your listening skills. And as you can see today, one of the things I'm doing via camera, which is super weird, but maintaining eye contact is really important. Um, avoid sitting behind barriers and establish equal positions. By the way, I don't know if you can see this, but I've got my arms crossed. You know, most people would say that's a closed position. So if you've got your arms crossed when you're listening to somebody, that actually may not be a very good idea. It may send the wrong signal. But a lot of times people just have this because their arms are cold or because it's comfortable for them to cross their arms. I will say this, rocking back way in your chair and like not looking at even worse, picking up your device and doing something on your device. Uh, it's pretty rough, right? Pretty rough. So yeah, so it's 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 these are all important things that that we need to do. And again, we've got these in, in here in the slide deck for you to, re, to for you to uh, refer to. Help others star in their movie. If you're gonna if you're gonna hear it's if you're gonna hear somebody, you need to make sure you're listening. That means keeping it personal, paying attention, paying attention to nonverbal considerations. So again, kind of that that idea about how do we lead change well. The last and least for this do's and don'ts. Keep your boss and team members informed. Maybe you're bored. Over communicate, but communicate in a way that that is a, a good way. Emphasize the shared goal. Don't make any front anybody look bad. Don't be jo job chasing or rejecting anyone else's leadership. The good leaders bring the best out in everybody around them, and that's a really important piece. The next one, which is kind of obvious, a duh, is that you need to acquire necessary re resources if you're going to change. If you're going to lead change, what does that mean? Well, financial, like you got to go out and get ROIs and 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 you know develop the case for purchasing something or human resources. We got to go out and and gather up people sometimes that maybe don't report to us or if they are in our organization, we may have to line people so appropriately to go after improvements or go after change that's necessary. Uh, in the infrastructure side, we may have to have new procedures or training. We may have to engage a training. Uh, a whole training initiative to help people see the new way of doing some things or involve subject matter experts in the conversation. So uh, look, as leaders, we oftentimes don't know all the details of the technical aspects. We've got to go out and negotiate for those people times. Delegating appropriately is super important in leading change. And this is kind of an anchor concept that we're going to leave this presentation with. We're going to wrap up here with step seven here in just a second. 
you do not have to do everything yourself. Yes, that's true. Actually, you can't do everything yourself. And so you need to take those D1, D2s, move them into D3s and D4s so they can lighten the load. And you also need to recognize that when they're D3s and D4s, they're probably not going to do it the same way you would. But if you can let go of that and provide good vision and direction and guardrails and boundaries, they can likely keep it up and, and they can go do things. Maybe you wouldn't have done it that way, but they'll get it done and they'll help you achieve your vision. And that's really important. Delegating appropriate is something, something that oftentimes we as leaders, we miss and we forget and we're unable to do. We're going to bring this thing into the barn. Most importantly, manage change. And I started with this. I'm ending with this. When we do improvements in an organization, and we teach this all the time with process improvement and, and Kaizen and, and lean initiatives and improving flow and eliminating waste and all these sort of things, we teach teams, um, senior leadership teams, we help them sift through all the, all the trivial mini breakthrough objectives and build their vision out of the vital few breakthrough objectives, that glimpse of the future. All of these things, all of these things that are improvement, they're going to equal change. And that's kind of the pain in the neck element, right? The best technical skills in the world, the best technical process improvement skills in the world, the best trained Kaizen practitioners are nowhere effective if they ignore the people side of it. So this leading, this last equation here, T times P equals E, the technical times the people equals effectiveness. No, it's not additive. It's multiplicative. Remember this, a great technical solution without doing any people management or people change leadership is not going to be effective. So you might have the best system implementation in the world, and if you don't prepare your people for it, if you don't exercise all these characteristics we've just been talking about, it's not going to be effective. But when you do it well and do both things well, man, it can be super effective. We're going to be coming back to this topic in February, and we're going to be talking through what GE learned about the change acceleration process and some of the steps they developed and tools along the way where you can help people let go, get into a neutral zone and come into a new beginning. And I hope you can join us for that for that podcast in February. Um, in between now and then, I'm gonna turn it back over to Chase here in just a second, but in between now and then, we would be delighted to connect with you. Um, connect with us on LinkedIn. Our contact information is in this presentation. And I gotta tell you guys, it's been an absolute delight and pleasure for me to be able to be on the podcast today. Chase, thank you so much, man. This has been awesome. I love talking about this stuff. I'm pretty passionate about it, as you can tell. I'm going to turn it back over to you. And guys, thanks again so much for uh, for being uh, with us on this. Deb, thanks for your great comments. We really appreciate it. Chad, th thank you so much today. That was incredible. And and I even took away some notes and uh, what, what I can do better for my organization. Before we wrap up, if anybody has any questions for Chad or any discussion, please go ahead and raise that hand on Zoom and we will call on you for that, while you're raising your hand, oh, we have uh, Deb Farmer again. Uh, so, Chad, I'm going to allow her to talk. Yeah, awesome. I just wanted to say, I just wanted to say thank you um, because you touched on some real points. I can't wait to take it back and and do some introspection of who I am and how I've operate, but also how I've changed over the years with this organization in my 25 years with this health center and what the difference is as we've grown through this whole process. So thank you very much. And, and just so you know, PDSA is like a second language to us <laughs> at our, our center. So, yeah, so. I love it. Yeah. I love it. That's great to hear, Deb. <laughs> keep, it, keep up the great work. That's awesome. Super excited. Thank you again. Deb, thank you so much. Um, well, as we wrap up again, if you do have any questions or feedback for Chad, please raise your hand. A uh, few quick notes. Uh, one, our next seminar is on February 12th. I just went ahead and put that RSVP link into the chat. We will be continuing and picking up on number seven in February with Chad Smith. And thank you again to our sponsor, Higginbotham Insurance, for the sponsorship today. Uh, we will leave this open just for a few more moments if anybody would like any further discussion with Chad. Uh, otherwise, thank you so much for joining us today, and we wish you all the best.
Miss Farmer, I saw you rose your hand. I went ahead and allowed you to talk. If you want to unmute yourself, you can feel free to talk and visit. Sorry, that was a mistake, but the chat box, I can't get into the chat box to access anything. It says it's closed. I'm pretty sure the chat box for some reason today on our Zoom was disabled and we're not quite sure yeah. why, but uh, yeah. okay. we see that now, Deb. I'm so sorry. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Get the information out to you. Looks like we've got, uh, and I'm apologies, Gazal Ringer. Ringler, actually, Ringler, yeah. Yes, thank you, Chad. This was a very, very um, great presentation. I was wondering if there was a way that I could access the recording or get your slides, please. That is is yes and yes, and I'll turn it over to Chase. He's got the details. Jump in there, Chase. Yes, sir. We will be sending out this recording with the slide this afternoon or tomorrow morning um, for everybody's uh, pleasure to go ahead and rewatch. Thank and you. I highly this recommend that you, you awesome. I, and please engage with your folks, right? That's why we do this. We want to give those doses of hope out there. I mean, that is our whole premise of GI squared, for goodness sakes. And engage with your folks, engage with them on dialogue just around the situational leadership piece. That is such an important conversation to have. So thank you so much for that and uh, be looking for that email. We're grateful.